this association and a really warm welcome to everyone. It's a really good turnout in winter. And I said to Daphne, she's obviously a draw card. So today it's Fulton Mar and it's one of New Zealand preeminent fossil sites and it's at Middlemarch or around about Middlemarch. Daphne is the Honorary Associate Professor of Geology and she's going to discuss the history today. My first um, dealings with Fulton Mar was when they had the protest meeting to say Fulton Mar at the museum and that's when I heard Daphne and they also had at the same time Andrea Bossard and Shane Loder from Middlemarch and I was so impressed that people were fighting for it because the local farmer was going to sell it and it was going to end up being at risk of being mined for dolomites. So I'm delighted that the DCC has now purchased it. So I hand over to Daphne, who's also got a book that you can buy today. She'll autograph it and you'll get 20% off. Thank you, Daphne. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Moira. Um, thank you for the invitation to come and speak. And can everybody hear me okay? Is this all right? Good. Okay, well, as always, I've got far too many slides and I'll have to go fairly quickly to get through them, but um, I'll try and do so. Anyway, a brief history of Folden Mar and its treasures, um, starting in 1875 and finishing with hopefully the end of the year. Um, and then we'll be going out of sequence and going back 23 million years to explain what it's all about, but um, you'll understand that hopefully as we go on. Right, so where is it? Now I'm going to have to stand out here and point so I can see what you're seeing. Right, so this, see, there's a circular or semi-circular structure around here, and I'll show you another picture in a moment. Um, Middle March is down here somewhere. This is the Strath Tyre with the Tyre running through. This is the Rock and Pillars with their um, uh, cloud cover um, and this little hill here some of you might be familiar with it's called Conical Hill and it looks like a volcano and actually it was once a volcano and most of these some of these rocks here are volcanic but most of them are schist so I think this is schist here in the foreground so any of you who know the area around Middle March will know that the well, hang on the background rock um, the basement rock we call it is schist so there it is, and it outcrops in these kind of nice, rugged um, outcrops with interesting foliation and so on, and people build fence posts and houses and whatever out of it. So the background rock is schist. Um, Folden Mar, if you were able to fly over it um, with a drone or look at it from space or an aeroplane or whatever, would look like a green oasis in the middle of a lot of brown schist. The outline of the Ma is basically where this dotted line is here. And you'll notice that in the middle of this green patch is some white. And this is an open cast mining pit. And if you look really carefully, you can see that there's traces of old mining pits here. And I'll get onto that in a moment. And I think that <coughs> might be another one there. Um, so there's something different going on in this little, little patch of central Otago, well, a Strathtyri, I guess. Um, and we now know that it's a ma, but we didn't when I first started going there um, in the 1970s actually, but we didn't know until 2009 it was actually a ma, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, so that's where we're going, and let me move on. So who first found out about this site? We don't actually know. There's no... Sorry, I'll just wait till people have found a seat. There's some up the front and some over there. There's no evidence at all from um, any, any um, sources that I can find that Maori people who travelled through the Strathtari knew about this site at all. And in fact, when European settlers um, first turned up, they probably couldn't see anything on the surface at all. There would have been just tussock and totara and things like that. And, but somehow, by 1875, these gentlemen here, in their book on the report of the geology and gold fields of Otago, had seen a sample of the white material that um, I showed you in that previous, um, previous photograph. And um, um, Hutton, this gentleman, oh, no, don't do that, sorry. Um, Hutton, the gentleman on the top, 
who was a paleontologist like me, in fact his career and mine had got quite a lot of similarities, um, he recognised that the white material was made up of diatoms, which are tiny little algae, and I'll show you a picture of them um, in a moment. He was the Otago Provincial Geologist. We only ever had two, the first was James Hector, second was um, Frederick Hutton, and then the Otago Provincial Government System um, uh, disappeared completely. Anyway, he saw these little things under his microscope and recognised that they were diatoms. Not only that, they were freshwater ones. Um, and this was probably an ancient lake deposit. And there's just a few sentences in the middle of this report, which was mostly about gold and coal, because that's what the Otago Provincial Government was really interested in, something that would make money for them. Um, and um, little has changed. Gold's still pretty important out there, not so much coal. Um, so that was 1875, so that was very early on in the piece. Um, and then, as far as I can tell, nobody took any notice of it at all, until in um, 1910, the ODT, which actually plays a pivotal part in this story about Fold and Ma, had a small um, paragraph that said, um, Mr Spate, Assistant Curator at Canterbury Museum, has received from Middlemarch Otago some interesting specimens. They are pieces of diatomaceous earth, which it is reported came from a deposit covering about 120 acres, and that's just about the same as we think it is now, with a thickness of 70 feet. We now know it's much thicker than that. And then I've highlighted in green, um, he, he said something which he had no idea how meaningful and true it was at the time. Mr Spate states that if this is so, the deposit will evidently rank as one of the most important in the world. Good old ODT and Mr. Robert Spate. Um, but again, nobody took any notice. So for about the next 40 or 50 years, nothing happened. Um, in the um, 1940s and 50s, a little bit of the diatomite was mined by, I think, by the, the farmer who owned it. And so the site is called Folden Hill, and it was actually subdivided off from the big Cottes Cottesbrook run. Um, I think in the 1880s. So Folden Hill, not Folden Hills, as you often see, um, has been a separate little farm in the middle of, or on the edge of, what was the um, Cottesbrook Run. And um, so nothing much happened in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I first went there probably at the, um, in the late 1970s on a field trip um, with... Um, um, some of my fellow students, and we collected a few bits of fossil leaf and so on, and I wasn't particularly interested in it. But in 1966, Ian McKellar, who some of you might know, um, who was a um, local Otago geologist, hello cousins and nieces and <laughs> over in the corner there, um, he produced this uh, lovely map at a scale of 1 to 250,000, uh, it's called the Dunedin Sheet, and here we have the schist shown in purple. There's Middlemarch and the railway line. Now the rail trail here. So this is modern um, um, river sediments and so on. The purple is the schist. You'll notice there's actually quite a lot of red, which are volcanic rocks. And then there's this little patch here of um, brown and white stripy uh, material. And um, so this was Folden Hills diatomite deposit. In the 1950s, um, some effort had been made to, my, uh, to um, map it um, because they were going to use the diatomite in the concrete for the Roxburgh Dam and the Waitaki Dams. Um, the diatomite can be used as, I think it's called pozzolan, to cool the concrete down slowly. So obviously when you've got a big mass of concrete, it heats up and it's not a good thing. So they, were going, they had a plan to mine, mine the diatomite take it by rail from Middlemarch back out to Milton and then to Roxburgh via um, you know, the, the old railway line through to Roxburgh. In the end, it was all costed. There's a lovely report with all the costings and you know, pounds and shillings and pence and whatever. In the end, they decided that the um, economics of it and perhaps the um, kind of engineering side of it didn't stack up. So there was a big report quite a lot of information, and then again, all went quiet and nothing much happened. Then we had this map, and then in the 19, um, late 1990s, I think about 1999, 
A new mining company was set up. It was called Featherston Resources. Now, <clears throat> I haven't actually bought you a sample of the rock, but it is very light. And I thought originally that Featherstone Resources was because the rock was, you know, light like a feather. Um, it turns out that the company was based in Featherston Street in Wellington, so it was a com <laughs> complete coincidence. It had nothing to do with it, but I, it, it, I, I think it was rather good. Anyway, um, so um, um, a geologist called Alan Walker bought the mining rights. Um, the farm had actually sold off a little patch of 42 hectares right in the middle of it, the bit with the, you know, the, the white um, um, open um, cast pit there. Um, and so he bought th um, the mining rights to that pit and he decided he was going to set up a big mining operation and um, got consents and so on from the Dunedin City Council and all the other um, consents you need for mining and so on. And um, he um, had diggers in and in 2003, I, with some colleagues, including John Linquist, who's shown there um, with his chainsaw in hand, went um, to organise a, um, a field trip for the Ge Ge Geological Society of New Zealand, as it was then, we had a field trip and the conference was based in Dunedin and we wanted to go around central Otago and I decided that we would go to um, Folden Hill and have a look at this material and maybe collect a few fossil leaves and things and so we did. And fortuitously we arrived just after his digger had exposed a, um, a deep face of the diatomite. It was fresh. Um, and it showed these most amazing laminations. So this is one of the pits that we worked on. Um, this is another one here, though. You can't see it so well. Now, the diatomite is a very strange material. <clears throat> it feels like um, a block of cheese. You can cut it with a pocket knife um, or a spade, or in the case of John here, you can actually cut it with a chainsaw. Um, when it's wet, it's dark in colour. As it dries out, it becomes lighter and lighter in colour, so instead of being black diatomite, it becomes white diatomite, and it starts to feel like wet cardboard, and the layers peel apart. So when you go there on a field trip, and hopefully one of these days soon, I will be able to take people there on a field trip again. It hasn't been possible for the last four years. You split these blocks, and there's a leaf, or a fish, or who knows what. Um, but anyway, we, my colleague John here realised that these beautiful horizontal layers were a climate signal. And so the light and dark layers represented um, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. And in the pit, as it was, we could see um, probably maybe five metres thickness of them. We had no idea how far down it went. Um, and how thick it was altogether. But in the meantime, while we were thinking about it and applying for some money to do some more research, we kept taking field trips here. John um, would come with his chainsaw, not with, if we go again these days, we have to wear a lot more health and safety um, gear. But this was 2003, we weren't quite so safety conscious then as we maybe should have been. But anyway, I would take students there on field trips and we. We looked at these layers, we collected lots of fossils, and then we were fortunate enough to get a large grant from the Royal Society of New Zealand, a Marsden grant. So those of you who know about these things know that Marsden grants are the creme de la creme. If you have one, you can play at science with great, you know, great enjoyment and get huge, um, huge and amazing results. So the money was in part to drill in the middle of that kind of circular basin, and here's our drilling rig here. Um, this was in the middle of winter in 2009, and it was a very cold, frosty winter, and there's the drillers and the drilling rig, and there's the pit that I showed you before that you can see in the middle of the, you know, the green paddocks and so on. And we're standing outside the Ma structure, here it is here, and as I say, we didn't actually know it was a Ma, and I'll explain why. <clears throat> so in 2009, we drilled, it took nearly three or, three or four weeks, I think, and we had no idea what we were going to find below the surface. Um, now, this is out of, out of sequence, because I'm coming back to, oh, actually, I wonder if I can go on. Mm, yes, shall I? Right, I'll, I'll go back in a minute. Um, okay, 
what we were trying to find out, whether this structure was actually a ma. Now, a ma is M-A-A-R, not M-A-R-R, as my spell correct on my computer insists on changing it to. Um, so, we wanted to establish if this was a ma. And to do that, we had to drill right through the middle of this um, deposit, um, right down to the roots of it, and see what was underneath. And we did this. So a ma is a kind of a volcano that um, is actually quite common. They erupt violently, and you can see one of the very few that's ever been photographed in eruption. That one's in Alaska. And um, what happens is you have magma, hot magma, um, 1,200 degrees centigrade, rising up through the Earth's crust and hitting a body of water, and then you have a very violent eruption. Think of dropping cold water into boiling toffee or something, and you, you, know, you get a violent eruption. Quite short-lived, but very violent. So this um, is very like Folden would have been when it originated. Um, the uh, cloud of pulverised rock from the eruption goes up maybe 20 kilometres up into the air, and the thing that's really important is that a lot of it fills in the hole that's left, so there's a crater under here, and most of this material goes back down in it, but a lot of it forms a rim around the outside of a very deep hole in the ground. They're mostly small. They only ever get to one or maybe two kilometres in diameter because of the physics of the eruption, <coughs> but they leave a very deep hole, two or three hundred metres deep. So you have a small volcanic crater lake with a raised rim of volcanic debris, and the lake is a closed system. You don't have any streams running into it. Um, and so the sediments that normally occur in lakes, think of Lake Waihola, the streams running in, carrying in silt, and they fill up with muddy, you know, silty sediment. In this case, there's no mud or silt because there's no streams able to get in. And so the only things that actually um, fill in the lake in time are organic sediments um, from algae um, and a little bit of wind-blown dust. And what this means is that the upper part of the little lake, so this is what Folden would have looked like, and then it would have looked like this. The other part is oxygenated, and so fish can swim in it and, and insects can live in it. But the bottom part is totally anoxic, no oxygen. So the lake might have been 200 or 300 metres deep. The bottom 200 metres had no oxygen at all. So anything that fell into the lake and drifted down to the bottom is pickled there. And this is a really important point, and I just want to kind of keep reiterating why this makes this such an important site. So you get this exceptional preservation of plants and animals um, that fall down, drift down through the water, and land on the anoxic lake bed. And every year, a layer of diatoms builds up on the bottom, year by year by year by year. And so underneath Fold and Ma, underneath this paddock, is a structure that looks like this. We drilled down about that far through where the sediment, lake sediments would have been, and then we hit volcanic rock, and if we kept on going, maybe for a kilometre down, we would have got into the volcanic rocks right at the very bottom. But we stopped because, you know, we, we wanted the um, diatomite, not, a, not the other sediments. Right. Now, hang on, I'm just going to go back... To this one. Right, now this is a long and complicated word, but it's really important. Um, Fold and Ma, if you look on Wikipedia, as I'm sure you all consult Wikipedia often, you will find that there's a list of these sites called Conservat Lagerstaten deposits. And globally, they are very rare. Um, they are important because most of the major advances in understanding the history of life on Earth come from these tiny little sites. So little dots on the landscape but with amazing preservation. And um, because of this pickling effect, you get um, plants and animals, eyes and antennae and skin and you know soft parts preserved, and that is very, very rare. So in the Eocene, there's none in the Southern Hemisphere listed there. Um, there's one in Australia in the oligo Oligomyocene, and in the Miocene, there's Folden Ma and also Hinden Ma, which we might get onto if I have time. So these are very, very rare and important sites, and they mostly occur um, in um, ma deposits. So when we did this drilling, so this is the um, summary of the drilling report here. 
This is laminated diatomite. So these are these very finely year by year laminated um, sediments. They go down for 120 metres and then you get broken up bits of schist and volcanic debris and so on. Um, if you look carefully at a little tiny bit of that sediment and blow it up, this is what you see. And so what this gives us is a, a, a record of the climate and what was living in the lake and what fell into the lake year by year for 120,000 years. It is just incredible um, in terms of time resolution and so on. So every layer tells you what was happening uh, near Middle March, uh, 23 million years ago, kind of at one point in time. Um, one of the things we did was we looked at the um, pollen all the way up through the core, and the pollen grains right at the very bottom are charred. They're burned, they were um, incinerated during the eruption. There must have been forest there um, when the eruption occurred, um, and you wouldn't have wanted to be standing around anywhere near because it would have devastated a big area around it. Um, but the remains of the charred forest are still there in the bottom, the very bottom of the core. And then as you go up through the core, taking pollen samples, and these are samples of various plants, you can see that ferns come back in, and then eventually forest trees come back in, and all sorts of other interesting plants, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So the, this, we have this just amazing record of what was going on in this tiny little piece of um, Otago. Now, what is this material? If you look at it very closely, so we're looking at all this material, it's made up almost entirely of this one kind of diatom. This is a, a light microscope picture. This is a scanning electron microscope picture. Um, and they're mostly the same kind of diatom. So these are little algae um, um, living on the surface of this tiny little lake um, and flourishing in the spring and summer dying off in the autumn and the winter and sinking to the bottom and making these layers. There are also freshwater sponges, and I just wanted to show you this picture. Those are sponge pickles, are freshwater sponges. They do live in Lake Waihola. I've been out in a boat and collected some. But look at the detail. Those are about a micro, those little knobs and things are about a micron across. They're just, the, the preservation is just amazing. Um, but what um, is of, I guess, most interest to uh, um, the general public are the big fossils, not the things that you have to peer at under a microscope, but things that you can actually go and split the rock with your pocket knife or your hammer, and this is what you'll find. So there's millions of leaves. We've collected tens of thousands of them. Um, in fact, so many that on the last a few field trips I went on, we were saying, oh, got lots of those, toss them away, and I think, oh... And then we were stopped from going there, but we'll get on to that. <coughs> anyway, when you look at them, you split one of those um, layers and you see it, something that looks a bit brown like that, or maybe like that. Then you can see the margins, you can see the veins on it and so on. Um, if um, Jennifer Bannister, do any of you here know Jennifer from the botany department? Jennifer um, has been working on these um, in, as part of our project since 2003, and she is probably Australasia's best paleobotanist and she um, takes a leaf and she clears it so this is a 23 million year, year old leaf and this one and this one and this one and she clears them with um, hydrogen peroxide and sort of a variety of um, chemicals and so on and she reveals all the detail of the leaves and the preservation is so good that sometimes she's taken a leaf from the botanic gardens and prepared it in the same way. And I can't tell which is the fossil leaf and which is the modern one. The preservation is so good. And you can see the details here. Um, she also takes little um, snippets out of the side and looks at them, um, sorry, and, and um, treats them with um, um, stains. This is crystal violet, I think. And you can see the shape of the um, cells, the stomata, the um, hairs and so on, and that enables us to identify the leaves. So I'm just going to give you a very quick run through now of some of the things that we've found, and they really are amazing. So there aren't many ferns, there's a couple. This one here happens to have spores still present. Doesn't look great, but when you look at it under the microscope, that tells us this is Davalia, which is a pot plant I, I grow in my, in my house. Um, there's also a type of microsorum, and you can see here a drawing of the um, fossil. 
um, and these are the spores and so on, and we can match it to um, a modern, fairly closely related um, example. There are <coughs> one of the fossils that we find quite often are these big leaves here. Now, you all know Totara, there's Totara. It's got little spiky leaves that are about that long. This one is about that long. <laughs> And so it's a, a podocarpus, a relative of Totara, but one that you would um, have to go to maybe Queensland or um, somewhere to find somewhere much warmer. So this is one growing in Queensland. And so this is the first indication that maybe the climate was a lot warmer or way back then. We'll get, I'll move on to that again. So we have podocarpus and Prumnipitis. We've got other leaves which we haven't finished. These are papers we haven't finished writing yet. So probably Miro, which is really quite exciting. So Totara, or relative of Totara and Miro have been around for a long time. Um, then there are other interesting little leaves like this one here, which is Lazuriaga, which um, grows in our forests today and it's got these little berries. Um, very interesting leaves that kind of turn over to get to the sun. Um, there's a Stelia, you all know what a Stelia is like and we'll come back to this in a, in a minute or two. <coughs> And then one of my students, on one occasion, they brought me back this piece of leaf. It's about that long, and it's got big veins running through it, parallel veins. And, and I said, hmm, that looks interesting. And she said, what is it? And I said, I have no idea. So I gave it to um, Jennifer to prepare the cuticle. And here's the cuticle here. And it turns out that it's fossil, fossilised leaves of cabbage trees, cordyline um, not the same as the ones we have living around today, but it's been here for a long time. And then there's lots of these leaves, and some of you might recognise them. These are actually supplejack, ripoganum. Again, not the same as the modern ones that live around here today, but look how beautiful the cuticle is. See the arrangements of the cells? It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Really distinctive. And so most plant families in general have got their own distinctive leaf shape, and um, leaf cuticle, and with those both, um, you can identify the plants. Now, one of the fossils we found that was really exciting was the first fossil flower with pollen ever found in New Zealand. And Jennifer, um, with her beautiful preparation, I think she saw about this much of it, and then she over, you know, took hours and hours under her microscope preparing the rest of it, discovered that it was actually a whole flower, and not only that, it had anthers which still had pollen grains in them. So there are the pollen grains. Um, so this was a big deal. We tried and tried to find a, a, you know, what it was related to, and we couldn't, and so we've had to give it a new genus. It's called Foldenia, for Foldenma, um, and Staminosa. Um, and we haven't managed to find exactly what it's related to, but we think it's probably a re relative of Rutaceae. So think lemons and oranges, but not really like them at all. So this was the first paper that we wrote together on the first fossil flower um, with associated pollen from Fold and Ma. And of course, that made us very keen to find more. And so we kept looking. And since then, we've found many more. So this is one of the fairly, fairly recent paper, 2019. This is, now, if, the, if the, um, there's an asterisk, that shows that they don't live in New Zealand anymore. So they're now locally extinct, but they may live somewhere else in the world. This is a cania. Probably nobody here has ever heard of a cania. It lives in a little patch of forest on the east coast of um, Queensland, um, New South Wales. Um, it's endemic there, but it obviously lived in New Zealand once upon a time and has gone extinct. So, very small flowers, but again with pollen. Then there's other flowers. Now, these are beautiful, tiny little flowers with pollen. They're probably something closely related to Carmahi, Winemania. Then there's Eliacarpus. And these funny things, when I first saw them, I thought, what on earth is that? And my colleague, John Comran, who's a co-author of the book, said, I know what that is. And he found a modern Eliacarpus <laughs> flower and flattened it. And lo and behold, there it is. And then this beautiful flower here, which has got really gorgeous pollen with, see the beautiful ornamentation on the surface of it? Again, nothing like this lives in New Zealand today. Um, and we think it's cl most closely related to a um, Dubu zetia, which lives in New Caledonia today. So again, another s sort of hint that the climate was warmer. So flowers are pretty exciting. People all over the world are very excited about our flowers. Some of them don't look much. So there was this little stalk. Again, if I'd, I, I don't know who collected it, maybe I did, I would have said, ah, little branch with little knobs on it. 
Jennifer looked at it very carefully. These are tiny flowers and they've got pollen in them. And it belongs to um, Euphorbiaceae. And it is associated with these very interesting leaves. Again, they don't live in New Zealand anymore. Um, Melotus macaranga. We had to give them a new name because there was nothing to compare them with. So we called them Melaranga. Um, so those are, if you ever get there, that's one of the leaves you're likely to find. But one of the interesting things was most of the leaves are of Lauraceae. Now, Lauraceae doesn't really grow down here. Um, think of um, Balshmidia, Tawa, Tyreri, um, and Litsia in the North Island. And, but most of these leaves are Cryptocaria, which again, totally extinct in New Zealand now. We just don't have any. So we have lots of leaves from many different species of Lauraceae. And the important thing is, most often we identify the fossil vegetation from pollen grains, but the pollen grains of Lauraceae do not survive. They disintegrate. And so if we hadn't had the leaves, we would have had no idea what the forest that was growing around Folden Mar was like at all. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind. Then a few other interesting things. These funny flowers here, Alepis probably, um, these flowers here, fuchsia, the first and only fossil fuchsia flowers known from anywhere in the world. And with this beautiful, um, very distinctive two-poured pollen. So again, oldest record in the world of fossil fuchsias from Folden Mar. Um, this one is Dizoxylum, um, uh, which again only grows in the North Island. We've got um, flowers and leaves and squashed fruits. And very rarely, as a paleontologist, do you find all the parts of the plant preserved. Here we've got these lovely leaves of Hedicaria. This is the leaf. This is Jennifer's preparation. Can you see how beautifully preserved it is? This is the cuticle. These are the flowers. This is the pollen. We've got it all. Um, and again, this is a paper published in an international journal. And people get very excited about this. And then almost the last flower. Um, but actually, these are not flowers. These are actually um, leaves. So there are some parallel veined leaves. They're just brown. They're pretty ordinary. They don't look very much. But actually, they turned out to be orchid leaves. Now, there are about 25,000 species of orchids living in the world today. There are 10 fossils, and two, two of them come from Folden Ra. Um, and they happen to be um, two different um, families, or two, sorry, they're in the family that we still have here today, and they're most closely related to Arena and Dendrobium. So these are the only fossil records for the family from the Southern Hemisphere. So anybody who ever writes a paper on the origins of the orchids refers to our paper, which is really good. <laughs> anyway, we hope one day to find the flowers, but so far, no luck. So I'm, I'm going to very quickly go on because look, I'm looking at the time. So Foldenmar flora is um, very interesting and exciting. Um, we know a lot about it. We can reconstruct the forest that was growing around the little lake. But then we also have insects. And fossil insects um, are very rare indeed. Um, some of them here don't look much, but look, they've got eyes preserved. So we've got um, flies and midges and things. We've got um, termites. Termites drop their wings. They, they actually shed them and they fall, fell into the lake and fell down to the bottom. We've got bark bugs. This one here, you can see it's antennae. See the, and there's a modern one for comparison. And this was really, this was a really exciting find. So this was, um, we consulted with Tony Harris. You know, all know Tony who writes the um, columns in the ODT every week. Um, and he's an entomologist, and he was very excited by this. So there's a leaf which had all these little white spotty things, and this is what they look like. They're actually white and nacreous, and they turn out to be scale insects. You know, you spray your apple tree to get rid of scale insects, yeah? Um, here they are, still preserved in life position. There's 14 of them dotted along the vein. So when this leaf was detached from the tree, there were these little um, scale insects sucking sap from it, and then they fell into the lake, and we dug them up. 23 million years later. Pretty nice. <coughs> and then um, there are ants and wasps, <coughs> Hymenoptera. And I just put this in to show you. This is what this looked like once over my 
um, student and colleague who helped write the book. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like after he's prepared it some more and soaked it in ethanol. And you can see details of the wings and the antennae and so on. And there are a whole lot of ants. And this is really exciting too because New Zealand today has only 11 species of native ants. They're very rare here. In Australia, there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of ants. People have wondered, um, Warwick Don wrote a book about them, and wondered whether they'd once been more diverse and they'd gone extinct or whether they'd never been here. We've, um, unfortunately, he's, he died before we showed this. Um, this one little patch of rock that we're looking at has got more species of ants than live in the whole of New Zealand today. So they've obviously been here and gone extinct, probably with cooling climate. Then there are things like caddisflies, and actually the little, the little caddis thingy is still um, poking out. Um, this is work still to be done. Now, just um, 2022, I just wanted to show you we're still doing this work, even though we haven't been able to go there. So new fossils. This is a Dobson fly or an elder fly. Um, and they're the little things that live in um, streams, and they spend most of their life as larvae, and they bite your toes. You know, if you're... Um, some of you might have had that experience of this little thing coming up and nipping your toes. There's the fossil. It doesn't look much. This is what it looks like when it's studied and sort of um, in great detail. And it's the first um, record um, from, I think, from the southern hemisphere of this particular group of um, fossils. Um, I'm sorry, this group of insects. And then this is the most recent paper published just a month or two ago, 2023. This is what the fossil looks like. This if you look really carefully, it's got these lacy wings here, and it's a late, a fossil lace bug, and it lives on a stelia today. The only species we have in New Zealand today lives on a stelia. We've got fossil stelia. So this association goes back at least 23 million years, which is really remarkable. So just to put this in context, in 2005, when we found that leaf with all the little scale insects on it, there were only six um, insects known from New Zealand, older than the Ice Ages, the Quaternary. And now, Foldenna alone has produced four spiders, very rare as fossils, there they go there, 270 insects belonging to 15 different families and nine orders of insects. Really remarkable. And there's more. And then there were fish, and this was my finding. John Linquist cut a column, as you saw in that earlier picture, and what we would do is go and sit down and split them with our pocket knife. <laughs> you right, Cindy? Um, and on one of these occasions, I split it and I found this fish. This is one side of it and this is the other. So my knife, my pocket knife, filleted this fossil fish. And it turned out to be the first and oldest example of galaxids, of white bait, known anywhere in the world. Um, there are also fo oh, sorry. There are also fossil um, inanga, um, white bait, see the big eyes? And there is skin preserved and so on. Now, Rod Morris set this up. This is my fossil. He took a tank into the Geology Museum with a live white bait. Um, and waited until it swam by in the right position and took that photograph. It took him hours and hours. It's just amazing. Um, and then there's a fossil eel. The oldest record of fossil eels in the southern hemisphere comes from Folden Ma, and we also have them at Hinden, which I'm going to very quickly show you in a moment. And I got a colleague who's a <clears throat> in Australia who I've worked with, and she did this reconstruction of what fold and mar might have looked like. So all these insects and plants are real, real ones. She's put them there. Anyway, I just want to very briefly mention the other mars, Hinden mar. Um, we haven't written a book about them yet, but I guess it might come one day. Anyway, if you go... No, don't go there because it's on private property. If you were driving around the Hinden area, you would see a nice grassy paddock with sheep, and you'd see that... It kind of was a bit of a depression. Yeah, nothing much to see. Um, we knew they were there because they show up as high magnetic intensity spots if you fly over with a, an aeroplane with a mag magnetometer underneath. And again, these four of these are old Mars. They probably looked a bit like this. If you dig, take a digger and you dig in the middle of this nice green grassy paddock with the permission of the landowner, you find that there is laminated material there as well. Four different Mars, we've only looked at two of them, and only very briefly. 
But the interesting thing is, they've got some fossils that are similar to those at Folden and some that are completely different, and we have no idea what they are. <coughs> but most of the leaves there are nothophagus leaves. We have not one, say we've collected and looked at 10,000 leaves from Folden Mar, there are zero beech leaves, no nothophagus. At um, Hinden, almost all the leaves are nothophagus. It's um, a few million years younger, so obviously the climate had changed, maybe the soil was different, we don't know, we're still looking into this. But one of the nice things about um, Hinden is that every time we go there, we find these little yellow flowers which turn out to be um, Pseudopanax um, or maybe Schefflera, you know, five finger, um, five finger I think it is. Um, and they've got cuticle and they've got pollen and so on. So the Hinden flora, interesting, it's got cycads and palms and, and lots of different flowers, but different from the ones that um, fold in. It also has bugs, and I had to show you these pictures because they are so great. There's a damselfly wing. That's what it looks like, you know what damselflies are. There's lots of these beautiful, almost three-dimensional weevils with you know, their snouts and things. And this one I really like, it's a stink bug. And Uva, my colleague, who's found almost all of these, said there's lots of them and they all have their heads bitten off. <laughs> you can see in the picture, he's got no, I mean, we've got no idea what was going around biting their heads off. Who knows? Um, but um, already at Hindenmar, we've only worked there for a couple of years and then COVID hit and he had to go back to Germany. Um, already he's got about 240 insects in 20 different families and five different orders and they include a cicada which today only lives in, this, in Tasmania, these jumping plant lice and weevils and stink bugs and, and, and um, beetles with structural colour, all sorts of interesting things. And also more galaxids. And look at this one. I said that one of the things about Lagerstatin deposits like these, you can see eyes and skin and things. And look, Look, there's our poor little fish gasping, its last gasp. There's its eye, there's its gaping mouth and its lips. And you can, it's like an X-ray of a fish. So this one's 15 million years old. And the other thing, um, there are lots of droppings in the lake um, which are made up of sediment, sand grains, which don't live in the mar itself. So we deduce there must have been ducks and things. I mean, you can imagine ducks flying in or geese or whatever. And then, not long before he went back to Germany, Uwe found three feathers, probably duck feathers. He hasn't had time to work on them yet, but maybe he will. Now, are you okay for another few minutes? I've got some more slides here. Anyway, back to Folden Mar and why it's so important. So one of the things that I've already kind of hinted at is that Folden Mar is a record of a time when the climate was much warmer than it is today. Now this is a timeline from 70 million years ago, the dinosaurs died out here, here we go, getting towards the present day, there's Folden Mars eruption. So the planet was warm um, in the first part of the Cenozoic, and then there was a kind of a, a, a changing point, a tipping point, um, when glaciers first appeared on Antarctica, and then it's kind of gone up and down, and here we are today down here, but we're actually heading back up in this direction, which may not be a good thing, as you probably know. So Fold and Ma erupted at a time kind of in the middle of this, which is really, it's really important to understand it. So why is this so important? So what we have, so let me just re recap for a minute. Most of the records we have of past climate come from ice cores in Antarctica. And obviously from, they're from you know, the deep south and they're through ice. And they only go back about a million years. This is a record on the same kind of resolution going back 23 million years. And so we've got, it's probably a 120,000 year long annual record of climate changes. It's the only known such continuous high resolution record for the earliest Miocene in the whole world. Um, we can look at individual years and seasons. We can, yep, sort of on a human time scale, we can work out what the temperature was at middle March 23 million years ago. Um, today, the mean annual temperature at middle March is about 10 degrees. Then it was 18 degrees. Would have been actually quite nice. The rainfall um, was at least twice what it is today. Today it's about 800 millimetres a year. Back then it would be at least 1,500 because we had rainforest growing there. There would have been no frosts, no snow. Um, and the other thing that's interesting when you think of modern climate, 
we can pick up the ENSO cycle, you know, the El Nino, La Nina cycle. There it goes, in that core, if you look at it in huge detail. Also, and almost lastly, we're almost there, um, if you look at the details of the leaves and look at the size of the stomata and their density and so on, you can work out something about the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. And it turns out that when the climate was warmer 23 million years ago um, at Folden, um, and it, that's a record of what was happening around the world because you, you know, the atmosphere mixes, um, today in the world it's about 400 and... Yeah, at the, at, Sorry, let me just step back. Um, at the beginning of the Industrial, Resolu Industrial Revolution, the um, CO2 levels globally were about 300 parts per million. We are getting up to 400, and I think it's about 15 or something at the moment. When we get up to about 450 parts per million, we're probably going to have tipped the global climate into a irreversible state that will melt all the Greenland ice sheet and start melting Antarctica. If we look at Folden, we can see that the um, warmer temperatures back there were, um, at, were related to carbon dioxide levels that were about what we might get to about the middle of the century. Um, hopefully, I won't be around to see them, but my grandchildren and, and some other children here will be, some of you will be. Um, very worrying. It sounds good to have, you know, middle March with a subtropical climate, but might be good for middle March and not good for the rest of the planet. So, anyway, global significance of Folden. Um, the ecosystem, I've already talked to you about it. We've found tens of thousands of fossils with this amazing preservation. There's hundreds of species. There's probably thousands there. We're only scratching at the, the you know, top of it. They're all extinct species, but about half of them have got close living relatives here, and the rest of we have to go elsewhere to find them. They're really interesting to tell us about things that are important for conservation and so on, and for understanding the history of life in the Southern Hemisphere and New Zealand. Anyway, all of this, as some of you will know, was about to come to a sudden end. Um, in 2014, an Australian mining company bought the Featherstone Mining Licence and the 42 hectare um, centre part of the Ma. Um, and they were, there were, you know, kind of little hints that they were going to develop a bigger, you know, mine and so on. And I mean, that was fine, they let us go there and so on. And then in 2018, the ODT um, started reporting in a bit more detail about what their plans were. And then in the beginning of 2019, um, Simon Hartley, um, released a report from a confidential prospectus from the mining company which showed what they were planning to do. And it was that they were going to start mining on a vast scale. They were going to mine um, 500,000 tonnes a year for 27 years, starting in 2020, and in 2047, when all the diatomite that they could extract had gone, they would leave a lake behind in that... The lovely thing in the prospectus, which I've seen an illegally acquired copy of, is that they would leave it for the benefit of the community. It would have been totally toxic. There's um, um, sulphur in the sediments and so on. It would have been a toxic lake. The community wouldn't have been allowed to go anywhere near it. I mean, it was just absolutely terrible to think of. And not only that, all of the scientific information, educational inform information so would be all lost. Um, this fossil treasure that's unlike any other in the world would go, be gone. And you can't get it back again. This is the, the only one there is. And the Middlemarch community leapt into action. They asked me to come and give talks. They painted paintings. They raised money. There was international a national support to save Folden Ma. Some of you might have si signed the, uh, s uh, the um, online um, <coughs> petition. <coughs> Excuse me. Which I think is still there. <coughs> anyway, we're, I and my colleagues were getting really desperate. Um, mining rights supersede all other rights. If you have a legal mining right, and this dates back to the gold mining days, probably to the 1860s and 70s, it's, you, you, can't, you can't get rid of it. It's there. Um, and I talked to lawyers, I talked to colleagues, I talked to people in government and 
not, not just me, lots of other people did. And we just couldn't, couldn't figure out what to do. Um, the Geoscience Society of New Zealand um, wrote a, um, a document here um, um, wanting to designate Folden and some other sites as outstanding natural features of international significance based on their importance to geoscience, their rarity, well this one's unique, it's the only one there is, their scenic value, their tourism or recreational values, community and educational values, research potential, indigenous cultural values, taonga and so on. And even then, nothing seemed to be happening. Um, in, 20, in June 2019, the company, the Australian company, went into receivership and then into liquidation. And, it's, um, the, and the door was locked, the gate was locked. Nobody's been allowed to go there since then. And behind the scenes, the Dunedin City Council, bless them, um, um, were negotiating with the receivers and they've actually purchased in February this year, this was a big announcement, has purchased the 42 hectare site, which is the most of the Ma, and has extinguished the mining rights at last, after all this time. Um, so nobody in the future can go back there and commercially mine the diatomite, which is a good thing, <laughs> I think. Anyway, we weren't able to go there, COVID hit, um, I, just, I talked to my colleagues, um, Uva, who found most of the insects, and um, John Conran in Australia, who's been working with us since 2007. We decided we'd write a book putting all this all together. I'm still not knowing what the outcome would be. Um, Alan Mark, bless him, um, wrote us, uh, he was very, he's been very supportive about, of, about saving the site. He wrote the statement on the back cover and so on. And this kind of summarises... Um, and actually, not just summarise it, it provides more information than I can fit into a three quarters of an hour talk. Um, but anyway, what I would like to see is possibly is what's happened to Messel. Um, some of you may even have been to Messel, it's in Germany, and it's a mass site, formed in exactly the same way as Folden. Um, people have been doing scientific research there since, oh, for about 150 years or so. In the 1970s, um, the local council decided this would be a great municipal rubbish tip. <laughs> nice hole in the ground, deep hole in the ground, you know, useless, you know, only got fossils in it. And a f there was a fight that went on for years and years about saving it. And in 1995, it turned from being the local rubbish tip to being a UNESCO, UNESCO World Heritage Site, <laughs> which is a really good outcome. And I think maybe, in the end, that's what I would like to see happening at Folden Mar. I want research to continue. I want education to continue. I want people to be able to go there and you know, see these treasures for themselves. There's no point in having it and locking it up. It's like having the Hocken Library with the door locked tight. Or this museum with the door locked. Sorry, lots of treasures inside, but you're not allowed to see them. So um, anyway, that's what my hope is that we will get to eventually. Um, and I just want to say that although I'm giving the talk, and I guess I've been the research leader for 20 years now, the, the work is done by a huge team of people all over the world. Um, and here are some of them. There's Jennifer um, Bannister, there's Uva, Dallas Mildenhall, who works on the pollen, Tamo, one of my PhD students, John Linquist, the chainsaw man, who's, who was the first person to recognise the climate signal, um, John Conran from Australia, um, Ian and Liz, th there's dozens of others. I could have had 40 people up there, um, um, yeah, in the acknowledgements. Anyway, I've run out of voice and time's gone, so I'm <laughs> going to stop. Thank you. Thank you. The cousins are down the back. Turn upon the side them. Has anybody got any questions? <laughs> I mean, my voice lasts. Where's it out at the moment? The DCC is purchased up, but where are we at at the moment? Well, the, the answer to that is I don't exactly know. <laughs> um, we still can't go there. Um, it's been the, the doors, the, the doors, the gate has been locked to everybody, scientists, everybody, since um, the receivership um, began in, I think, June 2019. Nobody has been allowed to go back there, in spite of my pleas, you know. Um, the DCC ha actually 
now own the site, and I gather they have no intentions of selling it or on selling it or anything which is good, but for some reason they still will not allow us to go there. And if anybody can find out how we can change their minds, I'd be really happy to hear about it. They may, we've got a plan, the Save, Fold and Mar campaign, with all those you know, thousands of signatures, has got a very detailed plan for how to um, allow people to go there in a managed way. There's no point in people just going there on their own and you know scrabbling around. A, they won't know what they've destroyed. If they find something exciting, they won't know what it is. Um, you have to prepare and preserve the fossils really carefully to um, keep them. The insects are all in a fridge or in several fridges in the geology department because if they're exposed to the air, they just fall to bits. So. Um, what we have to do for our research is take them out, prepare them, and photograph them in as much detail as we can. Having said that, I think having, you know, managed groups of people, maybe once or twice a month, and you know, when the weather's okay, um, in conjunction with the local farmer, that's what we used to do. I've taken hundreds of people there in the past, and it was fine. So I'm, I'm not sure. At the moment, I've decided I'll stop bothering the DCC. Though, I guess you're the DCC. I mean, this is a DCC output here. Yes? We have some volcanic rounds of relatively common around the world. Mm -hmm. How come there's a lot more, not a lot more like old and mild? Like um, well, there's a number of answers to that, and it's a very good question. They're common, but very few of them have got diatomite in them, almost none. Um, Mesomar, for example, has got oil shale, and it's black and it's sticky and it's got completely different um, preservation. Um, and it doesn't preserve plant fossils so well. It does preserve um, fish and, and um, animals and things. So fold and mar is... Um, has basically been kept intact since it was first formed. It's had you know younger sediments over the top. It hasn't been faulted or folded or you know compressed or whatever. Um, so all sorts of things can happen to fossil sites. You know most fossils that you know a record of past life are destroyed. Very few of them actually survive. You know 0. 0.000 something percent of all the plants and animals that have ever lived are found as fossils. And even then, I mean, with Fold and Ma, there's probably a million, millions of fossils, and we might, in a lifetime of research, find, you know, 20,000 or something rather. So Fold and Ma is a one-off. It's also, the climate signal um, is from a very interesting time when um, ice was just building up on Antarctica. Now, at the moment, we've got, you know, um, kilometres thick a, a kilometres thick ice sheet on Antarctica. It wasn't always like that. There was once forest on Antarctica. Um, so um, Folden happens to capture, a, you know, a really precise um, time frame. Hinden has got an, um, some laminated diatomite, but mostly it's sticky black um, sediment, quite different. Um, and also it's not as thick and it's not, and, and we've probably only got the bottom part of those Mars, not the whole thickness. In fact, at Folden, we've probably lost 100 metres, so probably once upon a time there was another, you know, 100 metres thick of sediment, which is gone. Yeah. So lots of that, sorry, that's a rather sort of um, messy answer, but yeah, does that help? Any other questions, or do you need to go and have a cup of tea? <laughs> I think you have earned a cup of tea. <laughs> well and truly, you've given us such a vision of what it, what this mark looks like. And it, it is incredible what you have done, how you have interpreted it, and brought it to everybody. So thank you very, very much. It's all right. I enjoy doing it. <laughs>I just got one last um, request. Please don't try and go there until the DC has given permission, because if you do, I will get blamed, and I really don't want that to happen. Okay, but you can look at the book. <laughs>